Good morning, everyone. Our keynote speaker today is Mia Mingus. Originally from the Caribbean, Mia is a transnational and transracial adoptee. Currently residing in California, Mia lives up to the recognition that she received from President Obama in 2013 when she was honored at the White House as an Asian and Pacific Islander women's champion of change. Her social justice work covers a legion of issues, from matters including the environment, disability and LGBTQ rights, to sexual violence. Mia believes in prison abolition and urges all of us to think and search critically beyond the nonprofit industrial complex. This morning, Mia will speak to us about the power of sharing our stories and the importance of intersectional and disability spaces. She'll further delve into the topic of loving each other as disabled people and also how we can hurt each other. With the honesty and candor that Mia brings to all her audiences, she's going to also share with us ideas about transforming ourselves and our relationships as we seek to transform the world. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker to DIS 2018, Mia Mingus. Can you see me? Sort of. <laughs> Over this thing. Hi, you all. How are you? It's really cold in Boston. <laughs> and it was raining, and my, I was like in my wheelchair. My glasses are getting rained on. I was just like, oh, well, this is, this is my life. <laughs> also, I should say that um, last night, as we flew into Boston, we got in here late, I think around 10.30 or 11, and of course, my wheelchair got broken by the airlines, so we had to get a claim done and everything, so at some point, I do have to step out to, they're gonna hopefully come and fix it, I don't know, but I'm sad, because I'm like, oh, it's taking me away from today, and I'm just ableism all the time. Um, so I do wanna say a couple of things first before I get started, so one thing is just, just to also say that I really want to thank you all so much for having me and that I want to give the organizers of this space another just a, appreciation and acknowledgement if you'll join me. Yeah. Because it takes a lot to put on events like this. It takes a lot to like have somebody over for dinner. Like it's it's a lot of work, um, and I want to especially extend thanks to Sandy who was like in contact with me this whole time. So just thank you all so much for this space. Um, and I also, in addition to the beautiful, beautiful acknowledgement that we had today, um, as well as political statements about, about indigenous folks and the rights that they deserve, I also want to extend gratitude to the people who clean and care for this building, the people who mop and vacuum the floors, who clean the toilets, who take out the trash and maintain the grounds, the people who built this building, and all the people who have also been displaced from where we are as well. I also want to acknowledge them. And I want to say also that, um, you know, when I started out doing work in disability justice work, before it was even called disability justice, uh, these spaces were so rare. And so I just, I want folks to not take it for granted today. I hope we don't, that, you know, so many people I know would kill to be able to be here. And so many people don't have access to this type of space. And I, I know that for a lot of us, this is our political work, this is our lives. We, you know, we seek out these spaces, we create them, and just to keep remembering that so many folks will never have access to them. And how do we keep reminding ourselves of who's not in the room, all the different people who are not here. Um, so I know that there's a lot of brilliant, brilliant uh, workshops scheduled for today, and I don't necessarily wanna get all into um, just analysis, because as Sharon was sharing, uh, when I was typing out what I would say today and I was thinking about it, you know, of course, there was a lot of analysis that came up and um, breaking down the connections between disability and prisons and immigration and race and gender and all of those things, but I also feel like for me, what was so powerful that kept coming up was also story and feeling. 
um, and longing and love for all of you and how precious it is to be here together, even if it's just for a day, uh, that, you know, to be in a space where we can center disabled people of color, disabled queer and trans folks, um, to be in a cross-disability space and how rare that also happens. Because I want to express gratitude for this space, a space that hold, to hold disability and intersectionality, a disability justice space. Because for decades in my life, I didn't have any spaces like this, and I didn't even have conversations that, you know, that could hold this. I didn't have people in my life who I could talk to about these things, and it would have meant the world to me to have a space to talk about how disability, race, gender, adoption, survivorship, violence, cure, queerness, and so, so much more connected and, and really collided in my life. And especially as a disabled child who had no one to talk about my lived experience with. I had nobody who really reflected any of my identities or who really talked to me about anything that was going on. Um, I had no one who could support me as I navigated, for example, the medical industrial complex on my own as a disabled girl Korean transracial and transnational adoptees surrounded constantly by white abled adults and doctors and nurses and practitioners who often didn't talk to me about what was happening except to tell me what a good patient that I was being. And I feel like the connections between good patient and good girl are so like twisted and combined and intertwined in, in themselves. And so as I, was preparing my, as I was preparing my remarks for today, I realized that there was, there was really a deep sadness that kept bubbling up in me, a deep longing and aching for what I wish that I had had, and a grief for all that I never had. And I think also a grief for all the other disabled kids and youth out there who are also so very isolated and the disabled people who would give anything to be able to be here with us today, and also many of whom who don't even know that these kind of spaces exist, who are surviving isolated in their families or in their communities, and don't even necessarily know that we are gathering here today, that people have been gathering like this. Because that was definitely me, I, I didn't know I was so very isolated and I was so very alone and I know that so many of us can relate to that. And because that is often what happens when we start to connect with our dreams and our visions and our longings, we often tap into our grief and our sadness, our heartbreak and our sorrow for what we never had, for the ways that we wished our lives could have been, for the spaces that we wish could have existed, for all that is still not. I think about what it would have meant to me to be able to have access to this kind of space when I was younger, or to even just know that this existed when I was younger, and how transformative that would have been in my life. I wish that someone had been there to talk about disability in a complex and nuanced way, to be able to hold what we now call disability justice, and whatever gets called in the future, I'm really excited for all the people that are taking disability justice and just taking it and you know, evolving it and making it even more amazing and spectacular. So whatever it becomes called in the future. Um, I wish that I had known that there was so much more out there, especially during some of my hardest times, especially when I was inside of the medical industrial complex experiencing so much violence, especially on those mornings when my blisters were still so raw from the days and weeks before, but I was still forced to put on my painful brace, a brace that I didn't need to be whole, that I didn't need to be whole, but others needed me to wear so that I could be the right kind of disabled child, right? One who they needed to be seen as trying to be as able-bodied as possible, trying to fix myself and walk and make my body be something other than it was, something other than I was, something other than I am. And because I stand here today in front of you all after all of those surgeries and after the braces and the physical therapies and all the other things, the forced healing, everything else. And I'm still just as disabled as I was then because the cure didn't work as, as I knew that it wouldn't. Even when I was a child, I knew that it wasn't going to work. I knew that this was bullshit. I can curse here, right? That's fine, right? This is. Well, I am. 
Um, but it didn't take, even though they really, really, really tried. <laughs> and I say that because I think that our stories are so powerful and magnificent. I hope that you all, everybody here in this room, will be able to share some of your story today here with each other because I think our lives so clearly encapsulate why we so desperately need these kind of spaces. Our lives are illustrations of disability and intersectionality and there is a wealth of knowledge there for us to learn from and use. And for so many of us, we don't tell our stories. If we don't tell our stories, who will? If we can't share our stories with each other, then who can we share them with? You know, I often think about all the things needed to hold my story, and I'm just gonna name a few because I'm not gonna make a huge laundry list here, but things like someone who understands disability and ableism, able supremacy, the medical industrial complex, someone who understands the ownership of children and the commodification of children and adoption, someone who understands ugliness and beauty and race and white supremacy, someone who understands the Caribbean, colonization, the US, the US South, anti-black racism, slavery, someone who understands patriarchy and misogyny, who understands rural lands, who understands queerness, queer people of color, all of these things and so much more, who, and who understand how all of these things intersect. Who is that person? Who are those people? How do we build more and more of these kind of folks and more and more of these kind of spaces to be able to hold all of our stories? Because I wonder what the things needed to hold your stories are. I wonder how many pieces of your stories weren't told because there wasn't anybody who could understand and hold them. And I wonder how many parts of all of our stories that we still have never told anybody because of this. And my story is just as much a story about Korean adoptees and Korea as it is a story about disability, as it is a story about feminism and queerness and growing up in, on a rural island outside of the US mainland. A part of this symposium is not only revealing the connections of different systems of oppression, trauma, and violence with disability, but also the connection of all of these things within ourselves and our lives and refusing to cut ourselves and our stories up, refusing to tell partial stories for other people's convenience, Repu refusing to separate our work for the comfort of others. Because this space should not be rare. This should be the norm. It should not be that we have to leave mainstream disability spaces or even alternative disability spaces to be able to be our full selves and have whole conversations about our own lives. It shouldn't be that we have to leave racial justice and people of color spaces to be able to fully name and examine how able supremacy and white supremacy work hand in hand to oppress and target disabled people of color and all people of color at large. It shouldn't be that we have to leave queer and feminist spaces to be able to talk about how gender oppression and ableism have deeply intertwined roots and why it is absolutely important to abolish the gender binary as it is to abolish able, abled supremacy. It shouldn't be that we have to go to the margins of the margins of the margins of the margins. And don't get me wrong, I love living out there. There is amazing things and our amazing people out there. And it shouldn't be that that's the only place where we can be whole. It shouldn't be that we have to hold our tongues or risk backlash or be met with empty silence just to be able to talk about our own realities and the realities of our communities. Just to be able to, again, talk about our own lives and our own lived experiences. Because this is also part of the isolation that we face every day. So in all of our sharp intersectional analysis, I think we also need to locate ourselves and our stories and where our lives live in all of their complexities, privilege, oppression, how we have been harmed and how we have been complicit in harm. None of us here are innocent. I think of this as a kind of access also a kind of liberatory access, because it's not enough just to make sure that we can get into the room or that the conversation is translated or that we can access the materials. 
And it's not enough for us to simply get to share what's important to us, though I know that many times we don't even get to share that. But that's not even important if no one knows how to hold what we're sharing, if no one knows how to understand and fully engage with what we are sharing. Because how many times have we been in rooms and shared our truths only to be met with backlash, avoidance, or blank faces and awkward silence? Because people have not done their own work to educate themselves to be able to meet us. Whether it is in white spaces, abled spaces, hearing spaces, neurotypical spaces, how many times has the conversation continued on as if we never shared at all? I don't just want technical and logistical access. I don't just want inclusion. I want liberatory access and access intimacy. I want us to not only be able to be part of spaces, but for us to be able to fully engage in spaces. I don't want us to get a seat at someone else's table. I want us to be able to build something more magnificent than a table together with our accomplices. Who says that tables are the only things? <laughs> I want us to be able to be understood and to be able to take part in principled struggle together, to be able to be human together, not just placated or politely listened to. And I want this for us, and I want this from us. Because the moment we acknowledge intersectionality, it also means that we must acknowledge and face ourselves. Because even within this room and to all the folks out there on the live stream, there are many, many, many differences between us and between those that aren't even able to join us here. Some of us are immigrants, some of us are not. Some of us are survivors of sexual violence, some of us are not. Some of us benefit from light skin privilege and or white passing privilege, some of us do not. Some of us benefit from anti-black racism or hearing supremacy or a world built for cis people. I want us to do our work so that when people whose oppression benefits us, when they share their truths or their questions, that we can meet them in those conversations. That we don't just listen to them, that we can join them in conversations about activism, strategy, action, accountability, and justice, and principled struggle. Because these kind of spaces, like the one that we're in today, I, I, they often feel like tiny oasises, right, in the middle of a desert. And that's, that's incredibly real. And I would also like to offer that they can also serve as a microcosm of the world in which we currently exist. And to think of them as any safer than anywhere else is an illusion. I would like to offer that multiple truths can exist and that one does not negate the other. This, this space can be both a welcome respite from the unrelenting storm that we are usually in, and both and, it can also be a storm as well. When I say liberatory access, I mean access that is more than simply having a ramp or being sent free or providing captions. Access for the sake of access or inclusion is not necessarily liberatory. But access done in the service of love and justice and connection and community is liberatory and has the power to transform. I want us to think beyond just knowing the right things to say and be able to truly engage. I want us to not only make sure that things are accessible, but also work to transform the conditions that created that inaccessibility in the first place. To not only meet the immediate needs of access, whether it's access to spaces, or access to education and resources, or access to dignity and agency, to not only meet the immediate needs of access, but also work to make sure that the inaccessibility doesn't happen again. And, and this is the crux of a lot of the transformative justice that I'm a part of, work that I'm a part of. So you work to not only address the harm and the immediate needs that the harm created, but you also make sure that the harm doesn't happen again and that you're working to transform the conditions that allowed the harm to happen in the first place. Because as we integrate disability justice into our political work more and more and more, as we grow it and cultivate it, and cultivate it we must also be mindful that it is not an easy fix. And if anything, I think that disability justice will require us to work harder and dig deeper. 
Disability justice should not only be about our analysis and political work, but it should also encompass how we do our work and how we treat each other as fellow disabled people with multiple oppressed identities and experiences. Because I know that I am not alone when I say this, that some of my deepest wounds have come from other disabled people and other disabled people who are like me. I know that I am not alone when I say that sometimes we can treat each other in more painful ways than those outside of our communities have treated us. As we work to change the world, we also have to work to change ourselves. And we must support each other in that change. And I know that a lot of the things that I'm talking about aren't things that are pleasant necessarily to talk about, but they are often the things that come up when we all come together. Ableism and other systems of oppression and violence have left their mark on us. We can't, on the one hand, understand how devastating capitalism, misogyny, and criminalization are, and then on the other hand, pretend as if they don't affect how we treat each other and ourselves. Because most of us treat ourselves in ways that we would never treat anybody else. Most of us talk to ourselves in ways that we would never talk to anybody else. Most of us are in an abusive relationship with ourselves, and that helps to lay the groundwork for abuse in the world. Because no matter how on point our analysis is, if we can't treat each other well, our work will not get far. The things that we do here today will not get far. Because the systems that we are up against will require collective work. If we could have changed them on our own, we would have done it already. And collective work requires that we are in relationship with each other in some way, shape, or form. You know, it's always so amazing to me that disabled people who are so incredibly isolated and exiled will also isolate and exile each other. And I know that most of us have been on both sides of this. Now, I am not saying that we all have to be besties with each other <laughs> or that people don't need to be accountable for their actions or harm that they've done. I'm not saying that at all. That's absolutely true. I'm not saying that you have to share space with every single person all the time. What I'm saying, though, is that disability justice requires us to understand intersectionality, and intersectionality requires that we learn how to hold and value difference and contradictions. So for example, you can be both oppressed and privileged by the same identity. You can have survived harm and do harm. These are contradictions that we hold. All of us hold them. I'm sure that all of us have been harmed in this room and all of us have either harmed or participated in harmed or looked away from harm in some way, shape or form, whether it's via our privilege, whatever it may be. What I'm saying is that it is not only those people out there who need to change, but it is us in here as well. What I'm saying is that isolation, exclusion, and erasure has been destructively wielded against us in our communities. So why would we want to wield them against each other? Because I would argue that disability justice, disability justice, the term, it's simply another term for love. And so is solidarity, access, and access intimacy. Those are just other ways of saying love. I would argue that our work for liberation is in itself simply a practice of love. And it's one of the deepest and most profound practices of love there is. People who will take to the streets, who will take to their computers, and for who? for people they've never met before, for themselves, for generations coming after them. If that's not love, I don't know what is. And the creation of this space also is an act of love. And if we can't love each other and ourselves, then what good is any of our work to get free? What good is it if we can break down an analysis around colonization and the prison, prison industrial complex or how we need to end the gender binary? If we can't love each other, 
if we can't love ourselves, if we can't reach out to break isolation and the walls that we've put up between each other as disabled people, then we will have already lost before we've won any political battle. What good is it if we can wage amazing campaigns if we all end up hating each other in the end of it? And I see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> if we can't practice addressing the hard things between each other, then how will we ever have a fighting chance to address the hard things in this world that keep our peoples locked up and locked out? because I know it's bad out there, you all. It's really, really bad. And I also know that it's gonna take a long time to change it. We've been here and we will be here again. And if we don't figure out a way to treat each other well and hold on to each other, then we don't have a chance. We have to work to transform the world. But we can only do that effectively if we can work to transform ourselves and our relationships with each other at the same time because our work depends on us and our relationships with each other. And if anyone is worth it, it is us and the generations of disabled children and people coming after us. We have a responsibility to leave them a legacy worth fighting for, to leave them powerful stories of not only how we were able to shut down prisons and shut down ICE, but also how we were able to come through harm together for the better how we were able to make amends with our disabled kin and heal together. One of the greatest ways that we can resist able supremacy is by loving each other. How we were able to practice transformative love together in the face of fear, isolation, and heartbreak. And I know there's a lot of heartbreak. But this is how we practice interdependence. This is how we practice trust and belonging and hope, all the things that we long for. This is how we practice disability justice and its most powerful and magnificent potential. So I hope you all have a wonderful symposium today. And thank you so much for having me. And I hope you love each other today. Thank you all.